All right, we'll go ahead and get started as folks continue to join us. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia, a bookseller at Politics and Prose, and we're live with Dara Horn and Elizabeth Brunig discussing People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll move to questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run out of time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC Live Transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. And we do want to thank all of you out there for joining us. We are very grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Renowned and beloved prize-winning novelist Dara Horn has been publishing penetrating essays since she was a teenager. Often asked by major publications to write on subjects related to Jewish culture, and increasingly in response to a recent wave of deadly anti-Semitic attacks, Horn was troubled to realize that all of these assignments had in common. She was being asked to write about dead Jews, never about living ones. In People Love Dead Jews, Horn reflects on subjects as far flung as the international veneration of Anne Frank, the mythology that Jewish family names were changed at Ellis Island, the blockbuster traveling exhibition Auschwitz, the marketing of the Jewish history of Harbin, China, and the little known life of the righteous Gentile Varian Fry. Throughout, she challenges us to confront the reasons why there might be so much fascination with Jewish deaths and so little respect for Jewish lives unfolding in the present. Author Dara Horn has written five novels and is one of Grant's best young American novelists. She has taught Jewish literature at Harvard, Sarah Lawrence College, and Yeshiva University. In conversation with her this evening is Elizabeth Brunig, an opinion and feature writer for the New York Times, where she writes about ethics, politics, theology, and economics. She previously worked as an opinion writer and editor for the Washington Post, where she was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing in 2019 for her reported story, What Do We Owe Her? For the time she has garnered praise and attention for her recent pieces on capital punishment, in particular, The Man I Saw Them Kill. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Dara Horn and Elizabeth Brunig. Take it away. Okay, thanks so much. And Dara, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really excited to talk to you about this book, which I enjoyed reading quite a bit. Uh, to give you a little more background on Dara, uh, who is a novelist I have been following for a long time. Uh, Dara is, of course, a novelist. She is an essayist. She's also a scholar professor of Jewish literature. And she focuses on pretty much every subject you would hesitate to bring up in mixed company, religion, politics, death, collective guilt, the vagaries of memory. And as of September 2nd, she's also joined the ranks of We Podcasters with Adventures with Dead Jews, a seven episode weekly series in which listeners will meet gay Jewish spies in the Civil War, Japanese Jewish specialists trying to build their own Jewish state, American and Soviet Jewish movie makers hoping to become Hebrew prophets, and among many others, a very righteous Tyrannosaurus Rex. With these strange, dark, hilarious, fascinating stories, Dara is going to guide listeners through the outsized role that dead Jews play in other people's imaginations and sometimes still play in ours. The podcast will serve as a kind of companion piece to this book, so I encourage you to pick up People Love Dead Jews with a title that will absolutely scandalize everybody who sees your bookshelf and to listen in on the podcast. Uh, but in the meantime, since I have the opportunity to grill Dara on everything that ran through my head as I was taking notes on this book, I want to start with a sort of current events -y question. Dara, uh, if you've been following the pullout stories from Afghanistan uh, as American forces have left after 20 years, uh, I wonder if you noticed that one of the big human interest stories that got a lot of attention was the story of the last Jew in Afghanistan, which reminded me a bit of the narrative you tell about um, the last Jew in Harbin, a city in China, which was historically occupied by Jews. This is a gentleman named Dan Ben Kanan, I believe. He's the current. He's the current one Jew of Harbin. The current one yeah, Jew. There of was Harbin. a previous last Jew who who died right. in the eighties. Yeah. So uh, right. 
And, and, and it seems to me that there's a, a, an enormous amount of interest, uh, sort of last unicorn narrative that's often projected onto the last Jews of any city, especially um, a particularly dangerous or totalitarian or rapidly shifting state or place, more so than uh, any other uh, particular sort of person. Uh, and I, I wonder what you make of this kind of extinction narrative that seems to grip uh, public attention so much and how it factors into uh, this broader theme of, of dead Jews in the civic imagination. Yes, um, well, that story that you mentioned about the West Jew of Afghanistan certainly caught my attention because um, I was interested in the way the story was used, mm -hmm. right? Because it was, so for people who don't know, this is like the, it's, there's a guy, his name is uh, Zebulon Simintov, I believe, uh, who's the, you know, he's the last Jew in Afghanistan. And the news story was basically that there were these like nonprofit groups that were trying to evacuate him with the, you know, with uh, the American departure from Kabul. And, um, you know, he refused to leave because and his official statement about this is, you know, he's the one guarding the, you know, the one remaining synagogue in Afghanistan. But as it turns out, it's really that he's um, avoiding his estranged wife in Israel, who has been waiting for him to, like, give her a religious divorce for 20 years. He also wanted his um, his rescuers to pay off his debts. Um, and this was sort of like, and this is the second time this guy has been in the news, because the original story about him in the news was 20 years ago when Americans first came to Afghanistan at the beginning of, you know, after the terrorist attacks in September 11, 2001. At that time, he was one of the last two Jews in Afghanistan. Um, and at that point, the story was that they both had been imprisoned by the Taliban and were bickering with each other so much in prison that they drove the Taliban nuts and the Taliban kicked them out of jail. So what I think is like, but what I think is interesting about this is like, I mean, the, is the way these stories are used as like comic relief, right? And because they're sort of become, as you put it, like a human interest story, right? It's like, ooh, look, there's this kooky guy. And like, oh, it's this like funny Mel Brooks moment, like where this guy won't leave or like whatever dopey thing. But it's like, what this is masking is like this, you know, complete annihilation of minorities in this society, right? Um, and that's what you see in all these other societies um, that you mentioned, like there's also this, um, you know, this has happened in a lot of Middle Eastern countries, which used to be incredibly diverse. And now like you have whole societies that are like, you know, only Libyan Muslims or only Shiite Arabs. Um, and what's, you know, and what I think, and that's true for the city I mentioned in the book. So I don't, I don't, I feel like I'm talking a lot and I don't know if, uh, can people hear me? It just sounds okay and everything like that. This is my first event for this book, so I'm a little nervous. Are we okay? I think we're doing well. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I can, the, the thing you mentioned about Harbin, though. So, this yes. is, um, um, I, it's, it, I'm, it's, this is a city in northeastern China. It's, um, south of Siberia, it's north of North Korea, which is, you know, as awesome as it sounds. And um, this is a city, but this is a city that was actually built by Jews because it was, there was um, the, in the 1890s, the Russian government got a concession from China to build a Trans-Siberian Railroad uh, through this area, which is traditionally called Manchuria in Northeastern China. Um, they basically needed people to build them a town um, at the junction of this railroad. They needed like educated Russian speaking entrepreneurs. And they're like, the problem is who wants to move to Manchuria? And they're like, well, hello, Jews. Would you like to live without anti-Semitic restrictions, but not have to become a bottom feeder in a new in a New York City sweatshop? Here's an option. You can move to Manchuria. And so this was, a, you know, 20,000 Jews were living in this. They built this city from nothing. Like there literally was it was a bend in a river. There was no city there. Um, but then what happened is you have successive regimes that um, basically made life more and more impossible for this community until basically the last family um, was evacuated um, in 1962. Um, and then there was that one woman, much like the guy in Afghanistan, who refused to leave and died in the old synagogue in 1986, I think. Um, and then there were no Jews in the city of Harbin for about 20 years. And then um, right now, today, there is one Jew in Harbin. So that's the one in the book that you mentioned, Don Ben Kanan. Um, he's actually an Israeli in his 70s. He was a journalist covering um, China for um, Israeli news media. And then he, he kind of went native, like he got a job 
at a university there. He settled there. He's been living there for about 20 years. Um, but what's amazing is he now is employed by the Chinese government as the one Jew of Harbin. And what I mean by that is the government decided to spend $30 million restoring Jewish heritage sites um, in this city with one Jew, this one man. Um, and the reason they are doing this, and this is what where it gets to the sort of idea behind this book, is extremely creepy reasons. Basically, what they, and they are very public about this, the government in Harbin, there's um, records of the mayor making speeches to this effect, where he basically says, Jews have money, we would like some. And if we restore these Jewish heritage sites, then Jews will come to Harbin and give us money, both as tourists and like as investors, because you know, that's what Jews do. And it's just, what's amazing to me is like, they actually did this. Like they spent $30 million in a city with only one Jew restoring these Jewish heritage sites. I don't think they've recouped their investment. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think it shows you is it's like this sort of, right? I mean, it's like, they said the quiet part out loud in this like deeply cynical exercise of like, now that all the Jews are gone, we're like, oh, how wonderful. Now we care about our cultural heritage. Right. And it's sort of in some ways, the same thing you see going on with this story, the way that story was used, as you mentioned, the story of the last Jew of Afghanistan, right? Because it's like, you know, like, oh, this is this quaint thing that like, oh, you know, how sweet, right? Or, or how, you know, like, this is funny, or this is like, just this quirky thing. Whereas what you're masking is like, really the destruction of a society, a society that's become completely homogenous, um, you know, and then is, you know, is doing this deeply cynical thing where then they're trying to benefit from the, from, you know, this people that they basically ended up expelling. And so, I mean, it's just a, it's an astonishing thing. And it is like, as you say, there's like these stories in many, many countries. And, you know, we happen to be hearing this one now about the last Jew of Afghanistan. And it's, it is this sort of like, this, it's very, it's deeply uncomfortable. And for me, like the, there's sort of the easy way to tell that story is the sentimental nostalgic way. Mm -hmm. And then the, but the truth is the part that makes the story uncomfortable. And to me, it's like, as a writer, like I've noticed that the uncomfortable moments are where the story is. Absolutely. I think there, there are two questions I have, I think, that, that follow from that. And, and I, it's hard to choose which one um, to follow with. It was such a rich answer. But, but I, I think that the one I'm going to follow with and then and mark that I have another one that also follows from that. So just sort of two branching paths. But th there's a line in, in the essay where you discuss Harbin, where you, you mentioned that for the Chinese government, um, this is a form of manifesting kind of Judeophilia, right? This respect for Jews because they have money. They know how to make money and save money and invest. And there are all of these bestsellers about sort of the Talmudic secrets of making money in Chinese bookstores and so on. And for them, uh, at least as one individual who you interviewed was representing it, this doesn't register as anti-Semitic. This represents as a kind of Judeophilia. And, and that to me echoed uh, this sense I, I often received growing up uh, in sort of Bush era, North Texas, that there's actually a sort of significant slipperiness between anti-Semitism and Judeophilia um, that you encounter with uh, a certain evangelical Christian style of, I, I guess, eschatological Zionism. Um, we have to restore Israel because we're trying to instigate the end of the world and so on and so <laughs> forth. That <laughs> is very... Um, it, it, it's very complicated, uh, this sort of, you know, dispensationalism. But, but I wondered if you could say, you know, more about your observations about that, because that seems to be the sort of line between light and darkness that this book looks very closely at, is this slippage between, you know, attempted benevolence, attempted benign uh, uh, Judeophilia that has a lot more in common with anti-Semitism than it may know or think. Yes. Well, so there's this role that Jews play in sort of a, like a, like the world's imagination that is completely uninterested in having anything to do with like actual Jews or actual Jewish culture. Right. And so that's where there's that, as you say, that line between, you know, this Judeophilia, because yes, this in, in this Chinese example, um, they are like, oh yes, we admire the Jews for their financial acumen and like, you know, so basically we're just talking about stereotypes here. Um, we're not talking about people. Also, um, I am now embarked as I write at the end of the book on studying the Talmud a page a day. 
I haven't gotten to the part yet where it tells you how to make money. And I'm pretty sure it's not coming anytime. I don't think the, the, the Talmud is about a lot of things and that is not one of them. Um, this is like, yeah, no. Um, and I mean, there's sort of, you know, you can call people naive, but I think that what you're getting at, um, you know, and maybe, you know, the you know, evangelical Christian example might be another way of looking at it. But I think what you're getting at though is something even bigger, right? Which is that like, there's this broader way that Jews are expected to sort of play this role in a public life. And it, as you say, it's often expressed in these very benign ways, right? Um, right? So, you know, the examples I give in this are, um, you know, there's a, a couple examples I give where I talk about um, like uh, Holocaust related museums. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that nobody, let's say, who goes to the Anne Frank Museum is thinking like, you know, is doing that, you know, out of any malevolent, you know, any malevolent urge, right? I mean, you know, anybody who's going to the Anne Frank Museum feels that they're going there, like, you know, out of, you know, some interest in a larger sense of humanity, right? I mean, this is like, you know, these are like, you know, this is a benevolent exercise. But the piece that I have in the book about the Anne Frank Museum talks about how there was this incident at the Anne Frank Museum in 2018, where there was a young man who was a Jewish man who was working at the museum and the museum would not, they, his, his, um, his employers at the museum would not allow him to wear his yarmulke to work, right? They made him hide it under a baseball hat and he appealed this decision to the museum board. And then he, um, the board deliberated for four months and then finally relented and let him wear his yarmulke to work. And as I put it in the book, four months seems like a really long time for the Anne Frank house to ponder whether or not it was a good idea, idea to um, force a Jew into hiding, right? So there's this idea that like, but yet the whole idea of that museum is like, you know, we're learning about the humanity of others, you know, like there's this message from, you know, the Anne Frank diaries, you know, from Anne Frank's diary, which is like, oh, this line in the diary that she writes, I still believe that, you know, in spite of everything that people are truly good at heart. Right, and this is like the words that are like plastered on the walls. But in the meantime, like in order to present this like overarching question about humanity, what you have to do is erase Jewish identity, right? It has to be about humanity. It has to not be about Jews. The whole appeal of someone like, uh, you know, the way that people have idolized Anne Frank is that, oh, this is someone just like you and me. Well, in order for someone to be just like you and me, they can't be themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, because, and what you're basically, you know, if, if your idea that like the reason we should not be you know, bigoted against not just Jews, but anyone is because, oh, those people are just like you and me. It's like, well, what if they're not? Then it would be, would it be okay to hate them and murder them? Because that's kind of what you're saying. And, you know, and this is what to me is so upsetting about this is that, you know, Jews spent like 3000 years not being like everybody else. Right. And that's like, you know, when you say like, there's this like the benign, the sort of this, the slippery division, you know, the blurry line between, I don't know, Judeophilia and anti-Semitism, I think, it comes from a lack of interest in like finding out what Jewish culture is, like a complete, like, and, and, a, and a wish to avoid it, right? Like making this guy cover up his yarmulke because that's gonna make people uncomfortable, right? Is this sort of like, you know, this idea that Jews are just teaching us some, they're here to teach us some nice lesson about humanity. Like they're here as some, to serve some other purpose, right? We tell stories about dead Jews that make us feel better about ourselves. And that actually have nothing to do with the content of these people's lives. Right, they're not about uh, the Jews themselves. They're about Jews generalized to a, a you know general human condition. Yes, mm -hmm. or I mean, in, in the best of cases. Yeah, or yes. if, if not worse. And and then the, the other question I had, especially considering um, how that particular story was framed, the last Jew in Afghanistan, it was framed as sort of funny, and uh, like you said, a kind of Mel Brooks spot. Yeah. Um, and, and it did occur to me reading about, uh, you know, the way that you frame the entwined themes, especially that you pull out of literature about fictional dead Jews, that there's, there's a real darkness, there's a perversity, there's also a kind of humor, there's something very wry and clever. Um, and it, it strikes me that so much of this sort of, as far as they can read it, the sort of Jewish personality in America is about that mix of traits. And it, it seems that it's been engineered to kind of beat people to the punch because of all of these ideas and needs and expectations that are projected onto American Jews. 
uh, by the rest of, of the American public. Um, and so, you know, how do you sort of see that sort of tendency in American Jews to sort of um, grapple with and deal with these expectations and needs and projections through a sort of wry humor or a dark humor as, as being, you know, is that um, a way of adjusting to this tendency in society, this obsession with, with dead Jews and this sort of, you know, dark preoccupation or, or is there something inside the culture itself that lends itself to a more Gothic uh, read on life? Um. Well, you've seen through it. I think it's a. I, I think it's a protective posture, right? Um, and I think that when people talk about you know Jewish culture in America, what you're talking about, um, and uh, in most cases, is um, a culture that's taking place in English, non-Jewish language, in which you're interacting with a Jewish and a non-Jewish audience. Um, and I think that that affects a lot of what people are able to say. Um, and this is something I see from my work as a Yiddish scholar, because, you know, when people are saying like, oh, is this is wry, oh, it's just so funny. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of Yiddish literature that's not funny, <laughs> right? And, you know, it's, um, you know, there's this need to like put this pose on. And I think that it is, I think it's a protective, uh, it's a protective mechanism. Um, but that said, I would, I, um, one thing that I would say about that is, and I do talk about this in, um, there's one, there's one chapter in the book that's about the, um, it's called Legends of Dead Jews, and it's about the um, myth of Ellis Island, right? And so this is sort of like uh, a classic American Jewish myth, which is that, you know, families' names were changed at Ellis Island, right? And there's all kinds of like tedious old jokes about this, about, you know, oh, the guy at the desk at Ellis Island couldn't pronounce my name, and so suddenly my name is Smith, right? It's like this kind of thing. And I mean, just like, you know, if anyone, out, and I can't see all of you here, but like if any of you out there think that, that, that just so for the record, it's not true. No one's name was ever changed at Ellis Island. Your great grandfather is not the exception. No one's name was ever changed at Ellis Island. So what's really interesting to me is once you establish that, that like, why did this story come into being? Why is this a story that people tell themselves? And also why are American Jews even today so attached to it? Because what I've noticed is when I write about this topic or when I've sp spoken about this topic, people get angry at me. Um, people get really mad. I get mobbed by people after I speak, you know, like, oh, you know what you said, that's really not true. You know, my great grandfather told my grandfather this and I know it's true. You know, maybe it wasn't true for everyone. It's true for me. You know, it's like this kind of like, and these are like educated skeptical people who, if you told them the story about some other group, they would be like, yeah, of course it's not true. Um, there's something this story, there's emotional work this story is doing. And in that particular case, you know, the, we have court records of how, um, from New York City civil court, because you had to go to court to change your name. And in changing your name, you had to present a petition to the court explaining why you wanted to change your name. We have tens of thousands of court records from Jewish families that were changing their names to non-Jewish sounding names. Mm -hmm. um, and they explain in their petitions that, you know, they can't get a job right? Their kid can't get into college. It's all things like that, right? I mean, and it's not like, it's not a secret. And this is like, you know, and this, it's like, there you go through, um, you know, and actually this isn't even, this isn't my research. It's a book um, by a historian named Kirsten Fermeglick. It's a book called A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, great title. Um, and it's about, um, she goes through all these court filings this is what she's done in her historical research. And she's like, you know, you go through these court records and they're just pages and pages and pages of Cohen's you know, in the historical records of New York City's civil court. And it's like, this story of this like happy accident at Ellis Island, it's serving the same purpose as that story of the last Jew of Afghanistan, right? It's kind of like, oh, there's this funny little thing that happened, right? And then it's like, what, what you're hiding is like a real horror, right? Because these tens of thousands of American Jews who changed their last names did it because they could not succeed in America because of American anti-Semitism. That's why they did it. And by telling their descendants that it happened in another way, they were protecting their descendants from that psychological damage, right? So there's, so there is a, so that's when I say that's a protective mechanism, it is in relationships with non-Jewish audiences, let's say in, you know, I don't know, 
um, you know, in the arts and that kind of thing in English. But I think it also is sort of protective mechanism within Jewish families as well. Um, I want to say one other thing about that, which is just, you know, you ask, like, is there something like, you know, this wryness or this, um, you know, sense of, you know, um, questioning or something that's within Jewish culture? Um, yes. Um, this is a culture, you know, this is one thing that I wrote about in, there's a chapter that you mentioned, fictional dead Jews. It's about like stories we want that, you know, stories that we want to tell about Jewish history and how they're not the stories that appear in Jewish languages. Um, what I write about in that chapter is how there's this expectation in English speaking literature that when you write a book, you tie it up with a bow at the end. And what I mean by that is not just, not that you maybe give it a happy ending, but that you give it like, a redemptive ending, or there's like a moment of grace, there's an epiphany, right? We use all these Christian terms for this. Um, but what you see in Jewish literature, a lot of Jewish literature in Jewish language, and when I say Jewish literature, I mean in Jewish languages, like in Hebrew and Yiddish and other Jewish languages. It often, they, those stories don't have these definitive endings. Um, I wouldn't say they're always, there are great Jewish writers who are humorous. So I think that's part of the impression of that as people like a writer like Shlomo Aleichem was primarily a comic writer. Um, but you also like, there's this tendency of these stories just, they, people don't want to end them. And because the idea in those stories, like the, the power of them is not that there's this like moment of redemption where people get saved at the end. Instead, the sort of like the moral direction of the story is toward resilience. Right. There's like this model of resilience and endurance. And what you see these characters going through is going through all these different situations and then enduring. And I think that there is something more in common with that, with the comic, with what, the way we think about comedy in Anglo-American, mm -hmm. um, in Anglo-American arts. Yes, that it, it doesn't end with a, a total resolution of anything. Correct. It doesn't end in, in a tragedy. Yes. yes. And, and, you know, one thing that I kept thinking about it, in considering the way that these stories works of journalism and fiction about dead Jews operate in society is that there's sort of a dark and a light side um, to the obscuring that they do. You know? So on the one hand, when, you, when all that you're exposed to as an outsider, as I am not Jewish myself, um, although I did for, for the audience uh, attend Brandeis University, which is 60% Jewish, was founded by Jews, the way that the university was able to start out as good as it was with professors as good as it has and has historically has is because it was founded post-war when they weren't letting Jews in the Ivy League to teach or to attend. Um, and so that's how Brandeis happened. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, again, a, a sad accident in history that when you hear about it on campus, is treated with a little bit of comedy, um, you know, sort of making lemonade. But I went to Brandeis. You don't have to be Jewish to go there or study anything Jewish related. But I did minor in Jewish studies just because it's the best department in the country. Um, and I had a great time doing it. But I did notice that you do have an insight into Jewish American life there behind a kind of curtain that you don't have. In, in general American society where, you know, the average exposure, you know, an American living in Texas where I'm from might have to the way that American Jews live their life could be Seinfeld or Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, and there you do get that kind of mask of wry humor. Um, but what is hidden when all we see are these sort of, you know, virtuous stories about people like Anne Frank who just stand in for you know, general innocent humanity or the sort of comic figures who are just a blank with lots of things projected onto them. What's the joyful side? What's the intricate side? What is the uniqueness of Judaism that's obscured there? Well, I mean, there's a lot because we're talking about, you know, several thousand years of material. Well, it's just what comes to mind for yes. you. Yes. Uh, stories that you would tell, for instance, would, that you were, when you were being commissioned repeatedly to write about dead Jews, what were the stories yes. you were dreaming of telling? Yes. Well, so, um, you know, I, you know, I have a doctorate in Yiddish and Hebrew literature. So like, there's just so many great writers and what, you know, and as a novelist, I was writing in English and I was jealous of these writers because of, not because of their lives, which generally were a whole lot worse than mine, um, but like, because of what they were able to do with their language, where they're able to travel through time. 
right? Because there's every language has um, an archeology, uh, kind of an archeology span of belief that's under it that maybe native speakers don't even hear, right? Like when you say to somebody in English, go the extra mile, you're not thinking like, oh, I'm quoting the gospels, but of course you are, right? This is, you know, when Jesus says, you know, I'll go one more mile beyond where you go. I'm going to get these references wrong. You know, when you say, oh, for better or for worse, like, you know, you're not thinking like, oh, I'm quoting the Anglican marriage ceremony, but you are, right? I mean, these are like references that are in every language. They come up like every time somebody sneezes, right? So in, you know, in Jewish literatures and in, in Jewish languages, those kinds of references are from the Torah and not just the Torah, but like, you know, the Torah, the Talmud, the sort of the, the all the, litur you know, the liturgy, all the commentaries are like, you know, there's sort of, it's almost like this archeological tale of layers upon layers of, of words, right? Which allow you to sort of travel through time. And to me, that is more than like this sort of like, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of things you could talk about in terms of like the uniqueness of Jewish culture. You could talk about those things like you mentioned, like, you know, humor, which I think is a mask. Paradox is one that is more perhaps, you know, close to humor, but not quite there. Paradox is something that's sort of a very big part of like Hasidic thinking. That's, you know, religious movement in Judaism from about 300 years ago. But I would say it's timelessness. It's this idea that, um, so the, the historian Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, who's a Jewish historian, a, you know, 20, 20th century Jewish historian, he has a book called Zahor, which means the Hebrew word for remember. And he talks about how the practice of history is counter to the whole idea of Jewish culture, because Jewish culture doesn't engage in history, it engages in memory. And what he means by that, and the one thing that he says is, um, you know, the past in Jewish culture is not seen as a series, a sequence of events, which we look back on from a distance, but rather a series of situations into which we are existentially drawn. Um, and that's, really is what it's like growing up within the culture. And, you know, for me, I'm going to speak about it from the religious point of view, because I'm a religious person. Um, you know, like, when, like, we are taught that, like, you know, it was not like, each person is supposed to see themselves as if they personally came out of Egypt with the exodus from Egypt. That isn't like something that happened long ago. We acted out every year, right? I mean, it's like almost like the way some people feel about like civil war reenactment, right? It's like, you know, you are taking on, you take on the identity of these ancestors and you live their experiences. You are feeling it. Um, you know, that every person is, it's, you know, the, the we're taught that it wasn't just the generation of Israelites who stood at Sinai to receive the Torah that, also present were all of their future descendants. Um, so, I mean, this is sort of basically saying there were these important events that happened in your life that happened thousands of years before you were born. But those events are just as much part of your life as the events that are happening to you in your daily life and they're incorporated into your life. And what I think is interesting about this is it's very true to just our experience as human beings, right? Because, um, First of all, genetically, we're all made out of dead people, right? Like every single one of your genes is something you inherited from somebody who's, you know, somebody who's dead. Um, but also like emotionally, everything about who we are comes from people who came before us, right? The languages we speak, the books we're reading, the things that are important to us. Like even if just, you know, think about something that's important to you in your private life, there was someone in your life who gave you that, right? Who inspired you to be interested in that subject. Now think about that person. There was someone in that person's life who inspired that person to be excited about that. And then you see that then there was someone in that person's life. And so you have, in addition to like a biological heritage or whatever, you have an intellectual heritage, you have an emotional heritage, every person has that. In Judaism, that's explicit, right? Like, you know the names of all those people who came in between, right? Like you see like how each book is layered on every other book. And to me, that is sort of the timelessness. And, you know, it takes a dark turn when you think about the sort of recurrence of anti-Semitism in Jewish history, right? And that's why um, those kinds of moments, like when somebody walks into a synagogue and shoots people, you like Jews don't see that as a random event, even though it might be a random event. Jews don't see that as a random event. Jews see that as connected to thousands of years of other people doing the same thing. And the reason Jews see it that way is not because of some creepy genetic something, it's because that's what the culture teaches us, right? Is that everything that's happening, good and bad, are these events that have happened in the past that, are, that we're being drawn into, right? That everything that you do in the present is tied to the past. And I think that that's a very powerful lesson. I think it's very valuable for Americans today of any background, right? Especially in this moment we're having now where we're in a national conversation talking about, you know, how do we understand the evils of the past in this country? Are there ways of thinking about 
terrible things that happened in the past that are, you know, that, that are productive and, and, and that promote people's dignity. Um, you know, these are things that Jews have been talking about for thousands of years. And then I also think about, and this was especially, I mean, it, it's something that settled as I finished your book, which is the hagiography that comes out of the focus on dead Jews, in which every story seems to be written not for Jews, but for non-Jews, uh, for whom these dead Jews do some other kind of work. So the frozen Jews of Harbin are really about drawing investors. They're really about the business community of China, um, really not about Jews in any way, shape, or form. Likewise, as you point out at the Anne Frank Museum, they're trying to hide a Jewish employee because this is really about some other project that's only tangentially related to actual Jews. Do they, does this sort of hagiography, this tendency to sort of turn these dead Jews into abstractions that represent innocence or how certain political tendencies can go too far, et cetera, et cetera, um, does it make it difficult for writers or artists who are trying to depict Jewish lives or even you know Jewish people who are trying to enter into civil discourse in the United States to just be sort of imperfect, flawed individuals inhabiting the here and now, right? Taking on the weight of these sort of sainted abstractions you didn't ask for. You have this one role that you're supposed to be performing, but how can you be a human person and represent this whole mythology that's been ascribed to you by an external culture? I mean, it makes it impossible, right? I mean, because it's, you know, all of those things, um, the hagiography, as you call it, which I, is, well, you know, it's a good word for it. Um, it it's, it's designed to erase real people. Right, that's what it does. It makes it into this like image of humanity. And as you put it, like these stories are doing work for a non-Jewish public. Um, and what they're erasing, it makes it impossible to like, it makes it impossible sometimes to tell the truth. Um, one example of this I give in the book is um, Ellie Wiesel's book, Night. Yes. Um, that book was, um, th that book was originally, and this is again, this is not my scholarship. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a doctoral, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, college professor, I have always to cite my sources. This is not me. This is Naomi Seidman, a scholar of Yiddish literature um, at Berkeley. She um, she just, you know, sort of, you know, wrote an essay about this about 25 years ago. Um, that, um, the book that we all know as Night um, was originally published in Yiddish. Um, he and Elie Wiesel wrote that book in Yiddish. Its title was, And the World Was Silent. And it wasn't just the title that was different. The book, it's telling the same story about his experiences in these concentration camps, but it is like explodes with rage mm -hmm. at like this non-Jewish world that allowed this mass murder to happen, right? It's that is the mode of this book is this, ang it's a political anger. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote it in, when he translated it, or I should say adapted it into French um, for the version that you know is was then translated into the English, book night that people have read um, that he what he did was he was working with a, um, a French Catholic writer named Francois Mauriac who also was a Nobel, Nobel laureate um, and he was encouraged by Mauriac to sort of like reposition the book away from this political anger and toward like a theological angst um, so in other words like and, and so now it's like it's the same book yeah. and what he does is he, you know instead of saying like you know exploding with rage and like, you know, where were the nations of the world? It's where was God, right? It's like, and which was like, I mean, it was a very canny decision, right? Because he's publishing this book in French in 1958 um, for an audience of readers who are part of a culture and a nation that essentially was collaborating with the Nazis in a lot of ways. And, you know, and, and was not particularly sad to see the Jews go in most cases. And um, you know, what, who, what reader in that culture would want to read about, you know, how their society had failed and, you know, how they were, how they were guilty, like better to blame God, right? We can all get behind that, right? Like everybody wants to blame God, right? But like, so that's sort of become this, like, when you said like, you know, how can you just be a person in the world? It's like, you're not allowed to be angry, right? I mean, it's sort of like, it's, it's in some ways, like what the kind of things I'm talking about, it's sort of similar to, um, I think it's something a lot of my 
people in minority cultures feel that there's sort of this self-editing that you have to do in a public setting. Um, I know I feel it as a woman, like I'm sitting here on Zoom and I'm like, I have to smile on Zoom, right? <laughs> because if I don't smile, right, then it's like, you know, then I'm not appealing, right? Because, and no man would be sitting here smiling on Zoom while talking about these grim things, right? Yet the two of us, I don't, I'm not gonna speak for you, but you know, you feel this need, right? Like to present in this certain way because, and the way you're, and you're expected to present in a way that makes other people comfortable. Right. The priority is making other people comfortable instead of telling the truth. Um, I think that it makes it impossible to just be a person in a lot, you know, in, as, as you put it. Um, and that's, you know, that's one example. I mean, there's a lot of others, but I, I don't know how far down this road we want to go. So we're going to take questions in about four minutes. So in the meantime, I wanted to hit you with one lightning round question that I say okay. for the very last. <laughs> what did you think of Marjorie Taylor Greene's uh, Holocaust Museum turn, which she used to sort of absolve herself of making, um, let's say, irresponsible analogies concerning the Nazis. Uh, I mean, yeah. this ritual of like, you know, I don't have a lot of positive things to say about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, I think, though, that there's this ritual that we do where like, someone says something kind of anti-Semitic and it doesn't only have, and I want to be clear, like this, you know, this is like across the political spectrum. We see this happening. Um, someone says something that like could be construed or sometimes is not even ambiguously anti-Semitic. And then what happens is they get to, somebody drags them to the Holocaust Museum. And it's like, you know, and then like, you know, and, and as it was put to me, actually, I, I was uh, speaking with an, an interviewer about this recently. And the way the interviewer put it to me, he was like, the reason people do that is because it's cost free, right? Like, you know, we can all get behind Nazis were bad, right? Yes, like yes. that's easy, right? <laughs> like that's really easy. Um, and it means you don't have to engage with living Jews. You don't have to engage with any aspect of living Jewish culture now. Um, you don't have to talk, you know, you, you, you know the right things to say. Right. You don't have to be challenged and you end up looking great because, you know, there's no ambiguity about like, yeah, Nazis bad, you right. know, you know, hooray dead Jews, right? It's a cost-free mechanism. And I honestly, like, the thing about these museums also is it's like, you know, I understand the reasons for the, the Holocaust Museum in Washington and why it's there, et cetera. And that's probably a different conversation we could have at some point, but, um, boy, do I wish it was like a museum of like Jewish culture, like that tells you about like, you know, that it wasn't just, uh, you know, telling you about how these people were murdered. Um, actually, this is the first episode of my podcast is sort of some reflections about um, the, the Holocaust Museum um, and a number of other things. And, and this was something I used to ask people um, at public talks mm -hmm. when I would speak about my books, all of which are about Jewish culture. I always would ask people in the audience, how many people here can name four concentration camps? And then I would ask those same people, how many people here can name four Yiddish writers? Right. 85% of people murdered in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers. It's a famously literary culture. Why do we care so much about how these people died if we really are not willing to invest anything at all in learning about how these people lived? Right. Well, and so much of, um, I think, discussion, especially these days about the Holocaust, it has this instantaneous pivot from, you know, first it was the Jews and then, and that's the last you hear of Jews. <laughs> yes, yes. And this, this bothers me. This drives me crazy. I have, the, there, I talk about this at the end of the book too. There's this argument that you're expected to make. Um, and, you know, I've been prompted to make it too. Like where, when you write about, you know, some anti-Semitic incident in a, you know, for a mainstream publication where you're expected to make, like you said, this first they came for the, this like canary in the coal mine argument, right? right? Where like Jews are the canary in the coal mine. You know, when Jews are attacked, it's a sign that terrible things are going to happen in this society. But Think about how much you are, you know, think about how offensive that is to one's human dignity to say that. Because what you're basically saying is, you know, like we should care when Jews get murdered or maimed because they serve as a warning. It might be an ominous sign that later actual people might get attacked. Right. It's a bad sign for us. Yes. Uh, that's that's a that's a terrible way to think. Right. It's really terrible. Right. And it's like, and that's but that's the work that you're doing. You know, um, where you are expected to erase yourself, um, you know, in order to in order to be part of a, a public conversation, like you're in order that how think about how perverse this is that in order to earn public empathy, you have to erase yourself. Right. 
and to, to get buy-in on the idea that the murder of, of the, you know, the genocide of an entire culture is wrong. You have to suggest, yeah. you know, hypothetically, it could be uh, actually one that mattered. <laughs> yes, right, right, and not even like, and, and you know, not even just talking about you know a genocide that happened, you know, uh, you know, in the last century. Like talking about even you know anti-Semitic attacks that are happening in the last few years. Right, right. It's the same. It's like we're trained to talk that way about it. And it, it, it's also disturbing about the Holocaust Museum. I think with Marjorie Taylor Greene, and, and then I'll move on to questions. Um, is that you know you can go to the Holocaust Museum and you can sort of wash your hands of anti-Semitism. Yes, uh, by paying some tribute. Um, to dead Jews, but you also only have to condemn dead Nazis. <laughs> yes, that is true. There are, true. <laughs> there well, are that's, yes. living and, people with political sympathies that are not terribly <laughs> dissimilar from that style of fascism whom you then yes. have don't have to deal with. No, you can say, you know, Nazis then were bad. Right. And those we, people we can all get behind that, that, right? That's right up there with blaming God, right? We can all get behind that. Right. No right. one's going to give you trouble for that because they're dead and they have been for, for decades. And that is why people love their Jews. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna move on to some questions here. I've got the Q&A box open. Um, here we go. Um, uh, where do you look for realistic living examples of modern Jewish culture in media, either film, television, or writing? Um, so I, as I mentioned, I, you know, I read a lot in, in Jewish languages. So, I mean, I think that helps um, when you are reading in, uh, in a Jewish language because those are writers who are writing, you know, primarily for a Jewish audience. Um, but if, or is this, I, I'm not sure how to answer this question. Is this person like looking for like tips on, you know, <laughs> things to read? Um, um, you know, sort of a, um, maybe a behind the curtain look. It seems like, you know, where do you look for media that's beyond that you yes. are, are there any good Yiddish writers that you would recommend in translation? Oh, in tra okay. Well, so that's, that's a good one. Um, so, I mean, I have a lot of favorites, um, you know, as I would read as a starting point um, and because it's an easy way in, because it's not entirely alien, the um, stories by Shalom Aleichem of, of uh, that are called Tevi the Dairyman, which were the basis for Fiddler on the Roof, because when you read them, they are really different from Fiddler on the Roof. Um, you know, spoiler alert, there's a daughter who kills herself, Golda dies, Muddle drops dead. It's very dark, like it's nothing like the show. Um, and it's also, um, but what you see is the, um, the, the way he plays with textual sources, like, and, and there are some translations that really give you a handle on this. And you see like how he positions, Tevye positions himself as a biblical figure, even though he's like a poor man living the sad life. Um, he is like a character in a divine drama, right? And you see him living that life, um, you know, and, and acting out that life. Um, I want to give another example of um, uh, an Israeli writer, Aleph Bet Yehoshua, who, um, one of my favorite books, and this is again, not, not something recent, it's from, I think it was published in 1989, and maybe came out in English a few years later, a book called Mr. Mani. Um, this is a book, this is one of my this is a book that made me be, made me want to be a novelist. Um, this is a book about five generations of a Sephardi family, a Jewish family in Jerusalem, um, a Sephardi Jewish family um, with a, um, I don't even know how to call it. It's a suicidal gene. Mm -hmm. And the five stories in this book take place. They're all encounters with a different member of this family in a different generation. And the book moves backwards in time. It starts in the present, which in this book is like in the 1980s. Um, and, you know, and then it goes back to the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, tracing this family. And it's how each of these members of this family sort of negotiates um, with this, you know, nego and it's basically different people encountering these families in different historical moments and how the family remains consistent through this historical period, despite like, you know, now it's World War One, and now it's the Ottoman Empire. And now, you know, but, but you see sort of these consistent moments. And at the beginning, you just see, think they're all these random details, but then each detail comes back in subsequent generations. It goes back to that thing I mentioned earlier about the timelessness of how there's like this idea of this time being layered on top of itself. And you really see that animated in that book. Um, one thing I, I, I would mention um, is, you know, from um, a recent, you know, relatively recent TV show. Um, I did really like Shtisel, the um, Israeli series about, and which is on Netflix. It's about a Hasidic family um, in Jerusalem um, because I think it does do what so little does where um, there's a chapter I have in the book about attacks on the Hasidic community um, and the way they're reported in mainstream media. 
And I was looking at certain, um, you know, there was a shooting attack in Jersey City against a Hasidic, uh, there was attack on the Hasidic community, there was a stabbing attack in Muncie, New York. And I looked at news coverage of those events. And what amazed me about them was how I couldn't even find a news story about those attacks that didn't say something derogatory about the community while reporting the attack. Um, you know, like every article like that would be like, oh, well, you know, there was this zoning battle between these, you know, Hasidic Jews in Muncie and the non-Hasidic residents in Muncie. And I'm like, well, that's great context, you know, because like we always settle municipal disputes by walking into a Hanukkah party with a machete, right? Like that's normal. That makes sense. Like you see like the way that like Hasidic Jews are absolutely fair game for bigotry from people who would never say those things about non-Hasidic Jews. Um, and I think that that if you watch the show Shtisel, what's amazing about it is it's a sitcom about a family and they are a Hasidic family and they are living a Hasidic life. Actually, it's not Hasidic, it's Haredi. There's in the weeds, but for, you know, large, let, let's call them Hasidic because that's easier. Um, but it's this very religious Jewish family, but like it's just showing their lives and you see them as people but as people who are living this kind of life, but like you get to know them as characters. And it's like, it's just like, I think for a lot of people who really only know this community through stereotypes and caricatures, it's I think very, very eye-opening and revealing. So those are um, a couple of examples. Notice that all the examples I'm giving are in Jewish languages. Cause I do think that that makes a difference. Cause you're not the way people write those things. It's really not, they're writing it in a way where they don't feel like they have to present. Right. And so, so sort of combining two questions here, um, uh, there was a question about uh, any debate over the title of the book and what that might have been like. And there's also a question about what the reaction has been to your book and whether there's been any pushback to its message or its irreverent tone. And I imagine that has to do with the title as well. Yes. Um, so I still can't believe my publisher let me keep this title. <laughs> Um, but they were very nice about it. They never, they actually, if they pushed back on it, they didn't tell me, like, I didn't hear about it. Um, I suspect there were some like internal meetings within the publisher about it, but um, huh. they were very nice and not sharing any of that with me and just being like, this is what we're calling the book. Um, I, you know, I will tell you that um, uh, someone I know who's a rabbi in Manhattan was telling me recently that one of his congregants just wrote him like an angry all caps email about how he saw this book displayed in a bookstore and uh, you know down the street from the synagogue and how he went in and was yelling at the manager and how he's going to boycott this bookstore for promoting this book and I mean I thought that was pretty funny um, you know I think that like you know I hesitated with the title but I'm you know I think that part of this, what I'm arguing in this book is that people should not erase themselves. And that includes like what I talked about before about like how there's this priority on making other people feel comfortable. And I just feel like, like I'm done with that. Um, you know, and, and I sort of like, you know, it was just so, you know, to have to, and that's, that's part of like this making room, you know, sort of this erasing yourself in order to make room for other people. The title is kind of a dare. Um, you know, are you willing to sort of like live someone else's life to see what this is like? Um, are you willing to go there? Um, are you willing to read this book on the subway? Um, you know, it's sort of, it's deliberately sort of in that, in that vein. Um, so, um, but so far I've, I've been really pleasantly surprised. It's really, it's, you know, it got a great review in the New York Times yesterday. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's been really um, universally great reception, at least that I've heard, but, you know, I have my husband read reviews for me, so he won't tell me if, like, you know, <laughs> okay. there's trolling That's people, great, yeah. he, keeps them, he keeps them out of my way. <laughs> it definitely has provoked questions as I have read it uh, in public, sitting at the playground with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I did have someone say, like, I'm going to read it, but I'm going to take the, the jacket off. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, it's like corn in the 80s, like, you have to cover it with, like, it has these beautiful colors, and so it attracts people yes. to look at it. This nice, number, and then they're like, "Oh," um, and and someone asked me, you know, people love dead Jews, and I said, "Well, I'm Catholic. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of our whole thing." It's <laughs> 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 but uh, but yeah, I, I did call the chapter on Anne Frank everyone's second favorite dead Jew. <laughs> yeah, I have that. That's a, a nice, a nice. Uh, yes, it's full of, um, I would say, clever uh, turn like that. Um, and, and so uh, one of the questions that we have is actually um, about that, that sort of self-deprecating humor, um, which I think that, you know, 
you have said it in your view is sort of a mask, it is a deflection. Um, do you think there's a possibility of using it as a kind of allowable confrontation? Um, I do think it's, it is a confrontation. I think that's kind of what I've done with it here. Um, uh, in this point, I would I would talk about um, that as far as I go in terms of the humor and this, and this is, I mean, it's actually a fair, I mean, you can, I don't know if you agree with this. I mean, it, the book is actually kind of funny in a lot of places. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like, uh, you know, the message is rather dark, but it is, um, you know, it is a lot of, um, there is a lot of humor that's in the book. Um, the podcast, which um, is, I just, uh, the first episode just came out last week. There's another episode dropping next week. The, the pod, companion podcast in this book is called Adventures with Dead Jews. Um, and that one does like, as um, the person, as the questioner said, like does like use the humor as, um, what was the word? It was, it was Yes, it's confrontation. Yes, um, it the podcast weans very hard into the humor. Um, actually, the um, the production team told me that to find the music for the podcast, they um, listened to all the background music for. They spent eighteen hours listening to all the background music for um, um, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and then went and found those composers. So you know, you mentioned that earlier as like that kind of mask, but. Um, but it's using it sort of very directly in your face, um, right? In that sort of um, in that sort of way, it is um, like the episode that I have coming out tomorrow is about um, it's about that example of the the um, the Japanese attempt to create a Jewish state in Manchuria, um, and it goes back to that example you gave of the um, the the fine line between anti-Semitism and philo-Semitism, which is basically there was a point, and I won't labor the history here but there's a point where like people in Japan came in contact with like these um protocols of the elders of Zion like you know nut job anti-semitic conspiracy theories about Jews trying to take over the world and took it at face value but responded by being like these people are diabolically clever we want them on our team let's set up a Jewish state in Manchuria so they can work for us like that was actually their, that was actually their goal. And it's like, it's amazing to see. So um, there is like, yes, I am sort of using the humor um, and also to draw people, you know, as a, as a confrontation, but also using storytelling to draw people in because, um, you know, I'm not really a polemical writer. I'm not like, um, you know, I'm not good at arguing. I'm really bad at it. I've never like won an argument at a dinner table. Um, that's not who I am, but I am a storyteller. And for me, it's like that, what Yerushalmi said that I quoted earlier about, um, the situations into which one is existentially drawn. I like to draw the reader or in the podcast, the listener into a situation. And in other words, what I'm doing is I'm not just confronting you with something and throwing it in your face, but I'm also like, I'm putting you there, right? You then become part of the story. Like you are with me walking through Harbin in this crazy Jewish museum where, you know, they're telling you about this wonderful community, but not telling you why it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of bringing you along on this journey. I think that about wraps it up for tonight. Thank you, everybody, uh, so much for tuning in. Uh, Thank this you. Has been a uh, fantastic uh, event for me. I've learned a lot. Um, great book. And thank you so much, Dara, again, for joining us tonight. Well, thank you so much for having me. And Liz, thanks so much for terrific questions. I feel like we need to go out to lunch and continue this at some point. I love it. Yes. <laughs> thanks so much. And we at Politics and Prose, of course, would really like to thank Dara Horn, Elizabeth Brunig for this fantastic event and our audience out there for tuning in with your thoughtful and engaging questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this incredible programming and we couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So please follow the link in the chat to purchase your copy of People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present, or just visit us at politics-prose.com. And while you're there, feel free to check out the rest of our events coming up this fall. It'll be a really exciting fall winter season. And from our shelves to yours, we help you're out there staying strong, staying safe, and of course, staying well read. And we will see you next